I was wrong. In the past, I've kind of always held the belief that the average citizen or the average person probably has no need for body armor. Yes, I own body armor, and that might sound hypocritical, but I accept the fact that I probably will never need body armor. I'm not going to recommend that you go out and spend money that you cannot afford to acquire something that's probably never going to be useful to you. However, if you have the money to spend on it and you want to get into it and you're curious about body armor, I want to give you one place to look, one video where you can kind of read and listen, where you can kind of listen to, just get some general basics that would allow you to more easily start researching to get your own needs met. So let's talk about this today. Today, I want to give you the tools to understand more about body armor so that you can make the right choice for you. It's not quite as simple as get these plates, get this carrier, call it a day. You kind of need to look at your own needs and your own wants, what it is you're trying to protect yourself from, how much threat you want to be able to stop, and kind of make decisions that would be good for you. Because if you go on and look at a Grantham video and see his video about how to set up a plate carrier for military or duty use, that might not generally be what you as an average armed citizen would actually need or want. You probably don't need to have five radios and an admin pouch and handcuffs and there's just a lot of things that you may or may not need and you kind of need to look at your own needs and work towards that as far as your gear selection. So let's get into it. Before we really start talking about gear and sort of information, I want to talk about legality. In all 50 states, it's legal to sell body armor. The only state that I'm aware that has any sort of selling restrictions is in Connecticut. You can't sell it through the mail. You have to do face to face. But in the state of California, if you're curious about the laws on that, Generally, in most states, prohibited persons or violent felons can't have body armor, but I want you to do your own research when it comes to that. If you feel at all that you might have any sort of worry about it, look into it on your own. It's a totally different topic for a totally different day. Generally, however, if you're committing a crime while wearing body armor, it can be used as an add-on and uh, increase the severity of the crime that you're going to be punished for. So if you plan on doing crimes and you don't want to get an add-on, uh, don't wear body armor, but also just please don't break the law. I don't know. Or do. I mean, I, I really don't care what you do, but just understand the law. How much body armor do you need? Physically, what kind of size do you need to protect? A lot of people, when they see me wear this, they say, hey, Reno, it looks like that body armor is pretty small on you. And that's a pretty common thing you'll see on most people when they post a photo of them wearing body armor. Because you see that my shoulders aren't covered, my sides aren't covered, my gut is not covered, my dick is not covered. I know you want to protect that area. But you got to think about what the purpose of body armor is. If I were to wear a full-blown EOD suit, yeah, I'd be pretty damn invincible, but I wouldn't be very mobile. I wouldn't be able to do things. So it's a balance of how much you want to cover, how much you want to be able to move. So basically what you want to cover is the vitals. And what I mean by that is mostly your lungs, heart, and the cavity where if you were to take a shot to, you're down. You're not fighting. You're not coming back from that. An instant stop. You do not want to get hit in the chest. So it's really about covering the most important vital zone up here and sacrificing the fact that you can still get hit in the face, you can still get hit in the central nervous system down in the gut, but if you were to cover everything up on your whole body, you wouldn't be as mobile and as able to do anything. So it's a balance. So when it comes to threat levels and what you want to stop, there's an important thing to understand. NIJ certifications versus NIJ tested. Now you're going to see in a lot of body armor that they say, tested to NIJ standards, that does not mean that it has been certified by that NIJ organization as verified that it will stop that threat. They might have had some influencer that you're very fond of shoot a video of him firing a couple rounds into it and then firing a bunch of handgun rounds into it. And that's fine. That is entertainment. You will always catch me on every live stream of Mr. Guns and Gear when he premieres a video about body armor testing because I enjoy watching those as entertainment. But understand that when something isn't actually certified by the NIJ as whatever threat level it's saying, it's not necessarily something that you can trust. You have to choose whether you believe that company, that manufacturer. You don't know what sort of storage or what sort of uh, actual testing they've done. They might have just shot it at it, but that's not really what NIJ testing is. NIJ testing does a whole lot of stuff outside of just physically shooting the gun in a normal temperature room with a standard backing. There is a lot to it. I'm not going to get too into it, but basically here's the deal. If you're looking to stop handgun threats all the way up to 44 Magnum, 
level 3A is basically going to do what you need. There are some lower level body armors, but level 3A is fairly lightweight. You can get backpack panels, you can get soft body armor that is level 3A that will stop 9, 40, 45, 44 Magnum, and all the kind of handgun calibers you're typically going to come across. So if you're only looking to stop handgun threats, level 3A is probably what you need. It's very lightweight, very concealable, much more concealable than this level 4 plate. When it comes to rifle threats, level 3 is a good protection rating. However, it isn't always known to be able to stop M855 or M193 out of normal 556 uh, velocities. So for me, if you're looking to stop rifles in my mind, I always recommend that you go with level 4 or level 3 plus, but you need to keep in mind Level 3 plus currently is not an actual NIJ certified threat level. What it is is a level 3 plate that the manufacturer of that plate has gone out and tested it to an extra standard to be able to stop those special threats like 556. It's something that you need to be aware of because lots of companies make level 3 plus plates and you have to choose whether or not you trust it. A way to know that you could probably trust their level 3 plus rating is if they have level three plates and level four plates that are actually certified by the NIJ, it's probably good to go with them. It's probably okay to trust that their level three plus will stop it, but you're gonna wanna do your own research. Many of people do tests online. Level three plus is the only time where I would truly recommend that you go out and watch and see that people are actually reliably getting those plates to stop that actual 556 threat of M193 or M855. So if you're looking to stop threats like that, level three plus or level four, the downside of level four is typically it's thicker and heavier. The level four is designed to stop armor piercing 30-06. Um, so yeah, if you find yourself probably coming into contact with that, go ahead and get level four. Personally, I bought level four plates not because I was particularly worried about them. I just couldn't find the characteristics and pricing that I was looking for in a level 3 plus plate because sometimes they are more expensive due to them being marketed as lightweight. I was able to find a level 4 plate that fit my needs, fit my sizing that I needed, and a price range that I was comfortable with, and I was able to get a pretty good price on it, and I'm happy with that. You kind of need to consider what your goal is. Like I touched on earlier, if you watch a Grand Thumb video where he talks about how to set it up for military or duty use, that's great, and that's definitely helpful for people that fit into that role but the average person doesn't actually have those needs or those uses. They're not gonna be able to use it to that full potential. So you kind of need to think, what is it that you're actually looking to do? For me, if I just have a way to stop some bullets, I'm probably gonna be very rarely ever putting this on in a serious situation, if ever. There has been exactly one time in my life where I've ever actually wanted to put body armor on. I didn't have it at the time, and I kind of still think, you know, I probably won't ever need that again. But I own it because I own a lot of guns, why not own this? It's not that expensive for me to buy a pretty good setup, and so I just figured might as well. But the setup that I went with is very slick. I don't have a whole lot of stuff hanging off the edge of this. And if I take these mags out, I can actually conceal this fairly well under a jacket. Those of you that know me personally, if I were to be wearing this under a jacket, you'd probably notice that I look a little bit hunchbackish or just a little bit thick in the chest. You know, I'm looking a little extra plump and juicy that day. But people that don't know me, if I was wearing a loose jacket, you probably wouldn't be able to tell unless you're looking for me being wearing body armor, which the average person wouldn't be. So this setup would provide me a pretty good slick undercover or covert look as opposed to the typical overt style that you're probably going to see on Instagram and seeing people promoting. Those are definitely useful. There's a lot more to it, but it's like having a large backpack full of a lot of shit versus a small backpack that you can carry around that carries just the important things. I'm not running two comms. I'm not running an admin pouch. I'm just probably, if, the, if there's a time where I'm going to need body armor, I'm probably going to want to be bugging out and being able to maintain covert situations and just being in public. If I'm running a full overt plate carrier totally open with a whole bunch of shit on it, I'm going to stick out like a sore thumb, and that's not really what I'm looking to do, so that's why I have mine set up the way I do. When it comes to actual plate carriers, there's a ton to consider. Honestly, just go out and look for reviews. Look what you're actually looking to do, but some things to consider would be how things physically attach. This one uses a swift clip system if I want to run some sort of placard, but it's just Velcro. Most of them are kind of like that nowadays. you got Velcro within just a simple clip system. But if you're looking for an all-in-one package, they make those as well. 
you got to consider do you need modularity do you need ability to attach a lot of stuff to it or do you want something slick a couple good recommendations are Pharaoh, Pharaoh Concepts, uh, Spiritus Systems, Defender, Cry, JPCs. Uh, there's a lot out there, but any of those brands, either Pharaoh, Spiritus, Defender, or Cry, they all make good stuff. There's plenty of other options out there. Those are just a couple recommendations that I know that have a good track record. So when it comes to actually picking what plate and carrier system you want, it's kind of like a triangle. You got price, comfort, and weight, and then protection. So if you want a level four plate that's cheap, you're kind of going to be getting away from the area of where it's comfortable. So it's going to be heavier. If you want to spend a lot of money, you can get both of those. You know, you can get expensive and you can get high threat protection and comfortable. So you got to kind of figure out how much do you want to spend, how much you're physically able to spend. I'm not going to recommend that you go out and spend two grand on plates because I think that's a little ridiculous for the average person, but the option is there. But I'm also not going to recommend that you spend $70 on some weird Chineseium plates that you can't actually be sure will stop it. Because if you're putting body armor on, you don't want to be thinking in the back of your head, I don't think my plates are actually going to stop this threat. You want to be sure that what you're looking to do is actually going to be accomplished. So you can get pretty good brands for very inexpensive prices, but they might not be the most comfortable. They might not be the best shape or the highest threat level. So you got to kind of figure out where in that spectrum you want to live and where you want to get stuff. So when it comes to sizing shapes and geometry, there's typically two ways. There's the sappy plating system, and then there's small, medium, and large. Typically a 10 by 12, which is what this plate is, is considered a medium and 11 by 14 or some sort of other variation is a large but just understand that you need to measure yourself. A good way to measure is from nipple to nipple and collarbone down to basically your sternum. And you gotta kinda figure out where your vitals are and how big you are and what kind of threat you wanna stop. This plate is a 10 by 12 and it's arguably on a little bit of the small side. Realistically, I could probably get away with like a 10 and a half or an 11 by maybe 12 instead of, uh, or 12 or 13 but an 11 by 14 is kind of pushing it on me. So I ultimately chose to go with something that I can still move and actually exist in and I could be comfortable. There's a lot of different shapes and cuts and bends. And what I mean by that is the actual shape. So some plates are just, they're gonna go straight up like a sappy plate. This is what's considered a swimmer plate, which kind of has more of like a curvature up towards the top and then a very small flat section here. There's a lot of different sizes, a lot of different shapes. Swimmer cut and shooter cut are typically good for actually being able to move around and shoot in. It just depends on what you wanna, what you wanna go with. Because for me, if I have the swimmer or the more sleek style cuts, I lose protection up here, but do I need that to be protected, you know? So it's, you gotta kinda sacrifice comfort and movability with protection, you know, I wanna still be able to cross over my shoulders like this and be able to do stuff. So it's kind of why I've chosen the way that I've chosen it, but you gotta make that decision for yourself. Now, let's talk about curvature. Now, it's a plate, why would it need to be curved? Well, the human body is not flat. If I put just a flat surface on my body, it would be uncomfortable, it would not conform to the actual shape of my body, and I wouldn't be able to wear that comfortably for an extended period of time. I have gone several days wearing these plates, you know, I wake up in the morning, I put on my clothes, throw it on just to experience what it feels like to have this weight on me you know do some pull-ups do some push-ups just do some exercise go on a run and i got an idea of why this is the way it is and why it's a good thing that i spent the money for a triple curve or a multi-curve setup the more curves you have to it the more it adapts to your body nobody is straight up flat and that's not going to be comfortable on you so at the very minimum i recommend getting a single curve plate but multi-curve is typically better the more comfortable you have it set up the more likely you're going to be able to wear it for longer periods of times if needed so you got to kind of choose what's worth it for you flat or single curve are cheaper than multi-curve but is it worth it if you're not going to end up wanting to wear it when you might need it so something to consider when it comes to weight the heavier a plate is the less comfortable it is to wear the less mobile you are and the harder it is for you to be quick and move around so if you get a plate that's eight pounds each, that's 16 total pounds. The plates that I chose are about six and a half each. And that's a pretty good compromise between the super ultra light and the super cheap, super heavy. So there are cheap plates out there, but they're typically gonna be heavier. They're typically probably not gonna be multi-curve. So you gotta kind of figure out what's worth it for you. I recommend people buy the most comfortable, highest threat, 
and the most expensive that they can afford is really my general recommendation. Figure out how much you can spend and then try to get the best and lightest plate within that price range that covers the threats that you need to cover. So something to consider. Let's talk about pricing. There's budget options for plates around the $100 per plate, but you usually pay the price in terms of comfort and weight. Um, so make sure you're spending the money that you can actually balance out the threat protection and comfort that you need. If it's a cheaper plate, you're gonna wanna make sure that it's actually NIJ certified. NIJ tested can be fine, can be, that's the thing. The comfort in knowing that a plate has been tested and properly stored, manufactured, everything through the quality control process is tested and updated, that is something that I cannot recommend you don't buy something that's NIJ certified. Now, the addendum to that or the gotcha to that is the fact that level three plus is not currently a actual NIJ certified threat, but if the company has level three and level four plates that are NIJ certified and they are marketing it as level three plus, I'm comfortable go with, going with something like that. But there's plenty of companies out there that have no actual brand track record, no NIJ certification. You don't know where the materials were sourced. You don't know where it was manufactured. You bought it on eBay, you bought it on Wish. I definitely don't recommend you use those if you're actually serious about protecting yourself. Can they work? Maybe. Will they reliably work? Probably not. And that's not something I'm looking for in a situation where I'm gonna be putting on body armor, right? All right, bringing out the iPad. So materials, you basically have three typical styles that you're gonna run into. Steel, ceramic, and some sort of poly, and then sometimes a hybrid of ceramic and poly. The pros for steel, they're typically very cheap, they're typically rather thin, and that's pretty nice. You got something that's fairly inexpensive and it's fairly thin. However, the downsides, there are some major important ones we need to talk about. Weight, they're typically very heavy. In order to get to the threat level that you need, you're gonna probably need to be getting thicker plates, which is gonna add more weight to it. They start at around eight pounds and get up to the 10 pound range. Steel has some major downsides. Steel has the downsides of transferring energy more. It's typically heavier for higher threat protection. You're gonna need to get trauma pads to counteract that. The buildup coats that they market towards catching spall typically adds an increased price. So then the good steel typically gets you into the price range where you can get good ceramic. So for me, I don't really recommend steel, but I will give you a couple recommendations that I know of and kind of talk about the pros and cons of them. Generally, why I don't recommend AR500. Let's talk about that. So it has all the steel inherent downsides. I'm not saying they're bad, but if you choose to buy them for your own reasons, feel free to weigh the pros and cons for yourself, but let's talk about it. So AR500 advertises a very tempting price. They say things like, oh, for $89, you can get a steel plate and that's fine. But when you add both the increased spall protection, the spall guard, the base coat buildup, the add the multi-curve shape to it, add trauma pads, you're looking at about $325 plus $70 for the trauma pads, meaning 400 bucks for a set of plates. They also have an eight to 10 week lead time. And for me, that's enough to no longer consider them. But then when you do the weight math, you got a plate that weighs around eight and a half pounds. You got trauma pads, you got the buildup coat. The plate carriers that they sell with them aren't very lightweight. All in all, you're automatically jumping up to about 18 to 20 pounds alone just for your plates. Then when you start thinking about adding on a magazine which weighs about a pound each loaded, plus whatever other medical kit or whatever the doodads you got on it, I honestly, I can't recommend AR500 armor. I know plenty of people have them and you trust your life to them and that's fine, but for me, when I look at the downsides that steel has, and then I look at the price of what AR500 I would actually think about recommending to you, it's just not worth it. When I can get a set of HESCO L210 ceramic plates that weigh less, cost less, and don't have an eight to 10 week lead time, I just couldn't recommend AR500 because of that. So if you're looking for a steel brand that I'm actually positive of, but I want you to do your own research into, Steel Ops. They're a pretty good company. They seem interesting. They seem to have figured out the right material. They don't use AR500. They use a stronger metal that is lighter weight for the same threat protection. They don't sell any of their plates with just the base coat. They all have a good spall protection. 
they seem to have pretty good ideas as far as shaping weight and everything so they're interesting they're also fairly inexpensive for a set so for me if i was looking to get steel armor i would definitely recommend steel ops i'm sure there are other manufacturers out there i don't have time to list them all i'm just listing a couple of the big ones that i know of when it comes to ceramics okay the cons of ceramics basically you can't throw them around as violently because people are afraid of them cracking but the current NIJ rating system actually does factor in drop testing when they shoot them. So they get them soaking wet after doing a heat thaw, heat, heat thaw cycle. They then weigh them and then drop them with full weight added onto them and then they shoot it. So for me, when I think about the cons of ceramic being more brittle, I don't have plans of jumping out of a building, wearing my plates and falling onto them. So that's not something that I'm really worried about. I'm not going to hit these with a hammer intentionally in the same way that I wouldn't hit any of my valuable items with a hammer intentionally. So I'm not too concerned about that, but it is a con that I do want to bring up. Some of the options are pretty thick. So when you think about ceramic, it's a ceramic material. This one is 0.67 inches thick, but there are some that get up to like 0.9 inches thick. And that's pretty thick. That's adding a lot of extra distance to your front and back, which basically gets into the realm of no longer concealable, which that might not be an issue for you at all. But more thickness means you're less mobile, a little bit harder to cross your shoulders over because you got more distance out in front. So it's something to consider. Now, when it comes to price, the cheap ceramic plates are all gonna be about eight bucks or eight pounds a piece. So you add 16 pounds of total weight just for the plates. Now, that's something to consider, but you don't need to run trauma pads with them necessarily. So it's still lighter than some of the cheaper steel options that get the same threat level protection. Now, the ceramic pros, you can get them in level four, meaning that you can actually get level four plates in ceramic, but you can't get them in steel. So if you want to be able to stop all the threats, you want to be able to stop 556 green tip or M193 at 3,200 feet per second, but you're not confident in steel, Level four is what you're looking for. If you don't wanna go with that level three plus rating and you want something that's guaranteed to stop those threats, level four is what you're looking for and you gotta go with some sort of ceramic or ceramic poly. There are way lighter options for ceramic on the market, meaning you can get ceramic plates that are like four and a half to five pounds a piece that are still level three plus or level four, which is pretty damn cool. So you get a lot lighter weight. Now granted, the very lightweight, very thin plates are more expensive. As with all things, the most comfortable, the lightest weight are gonna be more expensive. There's just something that you have to consider. So for me, because they also don't spall as much, they capture spall a lot better, I'm personally willing to go with ceramic. They're not quite as multi-hit rated, but I don't plan on taking seven shots to the chest and not getting the fuck out of there. If I am wearing steel armor that is in theory rated for indefinite number of shots, I'm not planning on surviving a situation where I take a hundred rounds to the chest. If you get shot that many times in the body armor, you're probably getting shot elsewhere that is causing you to die. So for me, I'm thinking about realistic situations where I might want body armor and probably more realistically would soft level 3A body armor that completely wraps around might be more useful. But for me, I've chosen to go with a plate system that allows me to stop higher rifle threats with the risk of not having my sides or whole body protected with it. So you gotta make that own decision for yourself. If you're looking for some ceramic brands, some of the ones I recommend would be Hesco's or the various rebrands. Hesco is kind of the industry standard. You can get plates like the L210, um, that is a special rifle threat that'll stop all your 5.56, all your common rifle rounds, as well as handgun rounds for about 270, I think for a set, sometimes on a pretty good sale. But the thing about Hesco is they also sell plates to other manufacturers that brand them as their own. So you can go to places like Body Armor Outlet and get the cheap lightweight plate. You can get the cheap level four plates for about 90 bucks a piece sometimes. So Hesco is definitely a brand that you wanna look into. RMA, they got good price performance options. They're NIJ certified just like Hesco. So it's one of those things where they offer good cheap plates. They also have some very expensive, very lightweight plates. So it's something to look into. Now, Hoplite. This is a company that I have plates for. Do I like Hoplite as a business and the company and the people that run it? No, absolutely not. Uh, horrible lead time, not very good customer service, 
but the plates are made by LTC, Leading Technology Composites. They are actually NIJ certified. LTC is an excellent company. The plates that I got were fairly lightweight. They were very inexpensive for the threat and weight and level protection. I got these level four multi-curve six and a half pound plates for, what was it, like 450, which ain't bad at all considering that most of the other Hescos or other brands out there that offer a similar style plate would be looking at around 650 for the set. So for me, I don't like Hoplite. I'm not gonna recommend you buy Hoplite, but when I bought them before I knew all those things about them, it was a damn good option for price and performance. Let's talk about the one that I'm sure you've probably all commented on and asked about by now, Battlesteel. If you go to Botax website, you can find a company called Battlesteel. Mr. Guns and Gear and all kinds of other, your favorite influencers have done tests on this company. Do I recommend them? No. They aren't NIJ certified. Yes, there have been many YouTubers that have shot at them. You probably might even know someone personally that's shot bullets at them. Are those tests legitimate and certified in the same way that the NIJ does them? No. They use Chinese materials and allegedly make them over here, but I wouldn't trust my life to something like that, and I don't recommend that you do either, so I couldn't personally recommend that you actually buy them. However, they're very cheap. They're very light. I don't know how they're doing it for so cheap. Probably something to do with the fact that they're not NIJ certified, so they don't have to pay for testing, and then you add on the fact that they are using Chinese materials and most likely assembling parts of it in China. So the labor is super cheap. I'm sure that has something to do with it. It might work. It probably will work. Do I recommend them? I couldn't in good conscience. And let me explain to you why. I am not telling you that your favorite budget option is not good. I am simply saying that if I heard that someone used something that I recommended to them and it caused them to die or be injured or hurt, because it was not capable of doing the things that I said it should be able to do, I don't know how I would sleep at night. If I told you, hey, Battlesteel is a good company, you should use their body armor, and you took a round with one of those on and you died, I don't know how I would, I don't know how I would sleep at night. I truly cannot recommend anything other than what I know for a fact is good to go. Have I recommended stuff in the past that might not be as good or might not be the best and most superior? Definitely. Will I probably recommend stuff that's not the best and most superior in the future? Yeah. But I can only recommend things with good conscience, things that I actually know about. Now, I might talk about things like PSA or other cheap companies, but I couldn't actually in good faith recommend them to you. You can do your own research and decide that it's what's right for you, but that's not going to be on me. So that's where I'm coming from when I don't recommend Battlesteel, and I'm sorry if I hurt your feelings by that. So let's wrap it all up. In summary, the quick and dirty. Figure out how much you want to spend. Figure out what sort of threat you need to protect. Figure out how you want to set it up. Do you want it covert or overt? Budget options typically are less comfortable. More expensive options can be more comfortable and lighter weight and stop more threats, but you gotta kind of find a good place in the middle. As a final note, I'm gonna talk about how I have mine set up. This is a Ferro Concept Slickster. Inside it, I have two Hoplite level four plates. They are swimmer cut, meaning that I have good mobility. They're medium sized, meaning that it covers the important parts. If I were to go to a large, I would probably be pushing it. I wouldn't be able to move around as much. I'd be a little bit more boxy. So I chose to go with a lighter weight plate. I can conceal these under a jacket. If I'm not running the mags, I can wear a jacket that's pretty thick and loose and I don't look super noticeable. Only time in my entire life that I've ever thought to myself, man, I wish I had body armor. Let's talk about that real quick. Sonoma County was on fire in 2017. We woke up at around 3 a.m. and had to get the hell out of our house. We packed everything up. I packed up all my guns. I packed up all our important documents, got in the car and left. We needed to make a pit stop. In that pit stop, I needed to go to a convenience store the convenience store was an absolute madhouse. People were running around scared. It was kind of just a little crazy. In that moment, I thought to myself, man, I'd really like to be able to have body armor on me. I was carrying a firearm on me at the time. So I was in a situation where I would have liked to actually have body armor. I could have been in a situation where I could conceal it and have it on me and have an extra level of protection. Do I foresee myself going out in full kit in the future? Probably not. I'm probably never going to actually have to put these on. However, considering current events with the riots going on, 
best believe I'm glad that I bought body armor at the beginning of the corona pandemic. So yeah, I'm pretty happy with that decision. Should you buy a body armor? I don't know. I can't make that decision for you, but hopefully I've given you enough information here to take that back with you and actually make the decisions that are right for you. And if you have any questions, drop a comment down below. I want to say thank you to everyone that supports the channel. I got to say thank you to one of my Patreon members, California EDC on Instagram, who sent me this absolutely phenomenal shirt. I am really enjoying wearing offensive clothing. Now, I don't mean in politically incorrect terms. I mean, I like wearing things that hurt to look at for people. I like being annoying sometimes, and that's just how I am. And I'm not going to change who I am for you or for anybody. So thank you, California EDC, my Patreon member. Thank you, all the other Patreon members. Thank you to everyone that likes, comments, subscribes, and supports the channel. As always, have fun, be safe, stay dangerous. Peace.